All right, there's some output uh, short conditions. If you short this thing, uh, you're going to draw lots of current. And uh, the current will go through this resistor. And if it becomes um, larger, this voltage across this resistor is larger than 0.6 volts, then you will start turning on this, uh, this transistor. And then it'll pull down on this. This has to be high in order for that to be on. So this is a, a way for it to turn off. So this is a uh, uh, short circuit protection. There's another one as well. So if you get too much current, if you're pulling too much current in the driver, you will get too much voltage across this resistor, which turns on this transistor. So it's the same thing, same circuit here, same circuit here. And what it does is it pulls down on the uh, base of the, of the Darlington, Darlington transistor here. So there's two ways for it to sort of protect itself. All right. Um, in order for it to not oscillate, there is a frequency compensation, or this would be called a Miller capacitor. You're adding Miller capacitance to this Zener, uh, this, to this uh, Darlington here. You have this Darlington, and uh, if you wanted to slow it down even more, then you would put in a uh, put in a capacitor across it. Forget this. Forget this is here. This is just an extra thing. Um, but uh, you will um, be able to slow down uh, this circuit here by putting in that capacitor. And this 30 picofarad, believe it or not, is on the chip. Uh, it, right in the center of the die is this big patch of metal, and it's actually this 30 picofarad capacitor. So that's, that's pretty interesting. All right, so I think think we basically have described uh, this part of the circuit, okay? That, that half of the thing we understand now. All right, so now we have to understand the input. And I'll be perfectly frank, I don't really understand the input quite yet. Um, but uh, we have a typical uh, input uh, for push pill a differential amplifier. So this is very, very typical. This structure here is very, very typical um, where you have um, a, uh, a load here that like, it's like an active load uh, into, the, into the thing. Um, it allows you to separate the current sources down here this extra transistor is part of the current source uh, on the bottom here. And um, there's a really weird thing that happens on the input, and that is this base here. Most of the time, this base isn't even connected to anything. Um, and um, this connection to this node here is very, very interesting, and it's called a floating floating bias. So if you take a look at this over here, this is a, um, a current part of the current source, right? So we have a constant current in this leg here. And actually, it's being driven from this. So it's not really a, uh, it's not from this other bias circuit over here. It's, it's from this one. So it's, it's pretty strange. But anyway, um, we have a collector here and we have a collector here. So the impedance on this line is infinite almost. It's a very, very high impedance, which means there's really no set voltage for this internal node here. It can sort of be what it needs to be, whatever. Um, and what happens is uh, for the input, you'll have a VBE drop here and you'll have a VBE drop here. So the voltage on this line here will be basically, you know, a volt difference than the input, all right? And if this was tied to ground or something else, then you'd be limited to how much voltage you could afford on the inputs. So if you have two inputs, they swing a certain distance, but they can have DC offset on top of them. So they could maybe be a volt swing, but maybe 20 volts positive. So one's 20 and one's 21. And there's this constant or uh, common, common voltage on the input. And this floating node, this node could actually float up and down to whatever it needs to be to handle that input. 
And so that's that's why this is constructed. Um, I don't. I haven't really thought through the whole thing and figured out exactly how it works, but I do know the functionality. So if we're just looking at the functionality of the part, this is this this floating node, okay? And like I say, in other op amps, you won't see this tied to anything, but in this case, it's allowed to float up and down. Um, it allows this thing to work within a certain range. I think a 741 can operate within three volts of the rails. I think that's correct. I think you need to be three volts above the negative and three volts below the positive. It, it's, it's not a great part. It's a very, very old part. You need to be, most op amps will operate to maybe two diode drops from the, from the top and two diode drops from the bottom, something like that. This, one, this one's a little bit more limited. In this particular implementation, this is the actual uh, schematic from one of the data sheets. Um, you see that uh, everything looks fine here. Now, when they went to actually implement it on the uh, uh, on the on the board that we have here, uh, they found that it didn't work quite right. This floating node just wasn't getting them to where they needed to go. All right, um, and so let me get a pen out. Um, the die, the uh, transistors that were chosen on the uh, on the die had a very large working voltage, um, and these 3904s did not. So they pl they played a trick in here. They they put an extra diode drop in these two legs, and this extra diode drop allowed them to have it operate more like a 741. Okay, so if you look at the schematic for the actual. Uh, evil scientist version, you'll notice there's these weird transistors here. These are those uh, Schottky diodes that I showed earlier, and that just allows this circuit to act, behave a little bit more like the uh, 741. All right. Um, as I said, this, this transistor, oops, go back out of it. This transistor here is pretty typical. It uh, is a buffered current source, um, and uh, don't ask me how it works now, but it allows it allows the uh, the current source to be a little more isolated and a little more stable. Um, but you can look that up. It's very very common to have the a two transistor thing here. I forget what it's called. Uh, I showed uh, that there's this document that they wrote, principles of operation. They do go through this floating node here. They call it a common mode control loop, and. Uh, I don't think that's a great title for it. It's this, it's this, uh, this floating, floating thing. And they, they do talk about it here, so you can you can read about it all you want. Um, let's see if I can find more about that. Uh, this extra. Okay, here we go. Here's a little. Uh, there, they do have an expl explanation about this uh, buffered, buffered current source, and what it allows is. Uh, that the current in these two legs are not upset by uh, too much here. They allow most of the current to be driven through this transistor. Um, and if you notice in the circuit here, there's actually an extra resistor as well. So uh, that's to keep this guy on, to DC bias this guy. Um, but it allows uh, most of the, uh, the base current um, coming through here. And anyway, it, does, it buffers it and isolates the uh, the current through this leg here so it's not it's not uh, modified as much all right but it does explain it in the book here as well um, yeah so I think that's about it of course now we, now that you have a through hole version you can go through and measure different things um, I actually found that you can measure Everything in this circuit, except for the current in these legs here and this node here. The uh, scope probe, when you attach a scope probe here, um, it just, the op amp stops working. You're, you're putting too much load. These are very, very high impedance loads, remember? Collector, collector, base, base. Yeah, these are very, very high impedance. So touching this node just ruins everything. I thought I'd have a great chance to use uh, to use this. Uh, 
Uh, this is an active probe. This is an FE, FET scope probe that, that puts on, I think it's marked on here. Yeah, uh, this is a 10 megohm 2 puff. So that's, that's about as good as it gets for scope probes. It has an active circuit and everything. I have a video on this. Uh, this is a uh, Tektronix P6202. Uh, yeah, you can find a video. Uh, I did a couple videos on, on uh, uh, FET input probes, or act active probes. Um, so I used that on this note, and it wasn't. It didn't have it. It didn't have enough either. Uh, it it loaded down this uh, the circuit as well. All right, that's for that's enough for this series. Uh, this again was from the uh, Evil Mad Scientist. Ten bucks for the PC board, um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a I think it's a great learning tool. Um, and uh, seven forty one was a company's answer to a Signetics part. I think Fairchild wanted to one-up the uh, Synetics part that uh, Bob Widler had done, and this was designed by somebody else. Different company.